So I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Robert Stroud. I live in Boise, Idaho, and I practice Kendo and Iaido, and arguably also Karate and Jodo. I've been practicing Kendo for about 41 years, and I enjoy the, the activity on many levels. Hmm. Well, all, all of us start for a different reason. So I was just wondering, maybe we go back to the beginning and say, when you were growing up, uh, I'm guessing it's also in where you are now, but what were you interested in? What kind of like games or sports or uh, things were you into? Taekwondo when I was when I was a little kid, I was 12 and 13. Um, when I was, I started karate, Shotokan Karate at University of Idaho when I was 19. And I, it was, you know, kind of, the typical university clubs twice a week and you know you'd start with uh, tons and tons of people and by the end of the semester it'd be you know a handful of uh, dedicated few and and it was you know twice a week couple hours every night and i uh, i had i majored in mechanical engineering and i managed to get through school and and consistently train um it was what happened was while i was at university, I, I was one of those people that, you know, wanted to train a lot. And so I, uh, the karate dojo was part of uh, Rocky Mountain Budokan, which is Hideki Wakabe's school in Sensei's school in uh, Denver. And so I went every summer and spent three months in Denver. And then it was more serious training. And that was actually where I not only did karate, but I started kendo and iaido. Mm. So it seems like based on what I'm hearing so far, you've always been serious about the practice, about the thing. Was that something in your personality or did something really draw you to the group besides just uh, the art itself? Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, in some ways, you know, the, the, the groups that I associated with, they just you trained. I mean, that was, that was the norm. So I didn't really have an option of being a part-time student. It was well, there's class, like in the summer in Denver, it was at that time something like, I think it was three days a week karate, and then uh, two days a week kendo, and then uh, half day on Saturdays. And you just, that's just what you did. And, um, you know, I, I kind of just had that mentality. And it, it, it you know, when you're, when you're passionate about practicing whatever martial art, you, you know, if you're one of those kind of people that really are enjoying it, and not just kind of, stepping in and out, which is also another way to do it. But if you get that kind of, you know, the, the, that hardcore nuts kind of approach, you just, you look for more chances to participate. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that just, it kind of happens. And I guess, you know, there's a good argument for it's, it's part of our psychology. These, these people that we get all consumed with practicing. So you eventually made this transition to Kendo and then Iaido, these like more weapon arts. Could you talk about that and what, what kind of motivated you to make the switch? Yeah, well, you know, I, when I went to Denver, I saw Kendo for the first time. And, you know, it's, it's I think, very uh, much in line with what a lot of people say. You see it and it's like, oh, cool, swords and armor. And, you, you know, you get to hit each other and it's, it's ki all the time. You know, it's all, it's fun. I, I was 19 and... And so you're you're quite taken by it. And so I was fortunate in that the um, the school in Denver had a really strong kendo group, and so I, I was able to fall into a really nice training regime. And, and you know what I've done over the years uses kind of those basics I developed there to expand and go on. Mm -hmm. Were you doing anything else besides just going to the practices? Were you like attending tournaments or seminars and well, seminars, you. seminars when I could, but you know, back in the like in the early '80s, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of kendo. I mean, even at that time, PNKF, the Pacific Northwest Kendo Federation, was called Washington State Kendo Federation, and there was, I think, if I'm right, only one other dojo that was in Portland, Oregon, which is one of the reasons I moved there. Is when I was off seeking work after graduation, I, I made a criteria that there had to be a, a kendo school somewhere in the, in that area. And there was one in Portland. Um, so I, I was never much of a tournament player. I did do, you know, for karate, I practiced probably, um, um, 10 years seriously before I kind of stopped and focused on kendo and EI, but I did a lot of tournaments when I was a Q and, 
uh, young black belt. And, and that was fun. And in kendo, I participated in tournaments a lot, but I was never really in an area that had a strong tournament culture. So, you know, I've never really had a coach. And, you know, although I've gone to like Eido Nationals or, and I've gone to Kendo Nationals, I, I've never really had uh, someone that was like, you know, developing a strong competitive team or having others with that uh, competition. So what's really happened over the years is despite not being a strong competitive participant early on, I'm, I work very hard at being a good chimpanzee these days because I've, I've found that there's, there's a lot of work you can do there that's very beneficial as well. So, yeah, I, I certainly see like, you know, in, in Southern Cal or some of the areas that are, you know, so-called Kendo or Eido hotspots, there's a lot of competition and that drives things a lot. And when I go to Japan and you certainly see it, you know, there's many Japanese that their whole experience was, you know, high school or college competitive Kendo. And it's, it's a different kind of way of getting at it. But I, I tended to come at it more of the, you know, interest in Budo, like karate. Kendo's really cool because now you're, you're dealing with all this other stuff, but that it's, you know, it's adjacent to a self-defense. And I actually, I, you know, I've explained to people, I like that because in some ways with karate, you get into like are these debates about, is it really effective, right? Even mixed martial arts. I mean, is that really street ready and effective? But I think it misses the point. The point on practicing is the, what you're doing. And so with kendo and iaido, you don't walk around with swords. So it's easy to avoid that whole self-defense conversation. You know, you can just get to, well, we're just practicing because it's, it's good for us. It's, it's interesting. You can practice for 40, 50 years. You're still learning new things. So you can, and that's tend to, that's tended to be how I've approached training over the years. I've, I've, I've enjoyed the fact that it's, it's not just a physical activity, like, like competition would tend to be. Um, how so do yeah, you, that, go ahead. Uh, how do you notice, or do you notice differences in, in someone's kendo when they are focusing on tournaments versus otherwise, because yes, you, you might not see them in competition if you don't go to it. And there might be like preparation time at the dojo, but otherwise kendo is kendo in the dojo. What do you notice as the difference between someone that focuses on competition versus uh, like a more just the practice? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's always hard to make generalizations, right? <laughs> so, yeah, you could, I guess there's an argument to be made for that. Um, I, I think, you know, you can, you can get where we're all going or where, where we're headed different ways. And, and it's not necessarily bad that you're a competitive player. It's just you're, you're going to tend to emphasize different types of training, um, you know, it's, I think where, where the, the problems are more, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, I can talk a lot more about Shinsa than I can about uh, competition. And, and in Shinsa, you see the classic where people, they're doing whatever it is they're doing. They're, they're practicing more of a Budo approach, the tournament approach, but then the Shinsa comes along. And, you know, I've, I've seen people taking a fourth Don test that are literally reading the Kata book the day of the exam, you know, and those kind of things where it's just, it's just, they have no plan, no, no approach of how to build that foundation to be successful. And so, you know, you see that, I think, you know, rather than trying to talk about, oh, that's one way, this way is another way. It might be more interesting to just, you know, what are good points, you know, and good points are having that strong base, you know, having a, a practice that's grounded in, in something, but it allows you to participate at multiple levels. You know, I, you know, the kind of people like I've been fortunate, I've seen several all Japan Kendo championships in person in, in Tokyo. And, you know, and I've seen lots of lots of uh, very senior level practice. And the, the, the things that impress me are those guys that are competitive, but they have strong basics. You know, they're, they're not just doing one thing. So I think that's what gets interesting is you can see someone that can do it all correctly and there and there there's depth to that foundation um, so it's not just oh i'm doing it correctly it's it's you know what's really going on and, and, and you know that's 
that's kind of the cool thing too, right? As you do it long enough, you start to see things like, wow, that's, there's something in there that's not obvious when you first start. Mm-hmm. And you, you see people that can do that in com- competition as well as their standard practice, as well as when they're talking and, and doing what we're doing right here, which I think is one of the hardest things is articulating some of this stuff because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit uh, nebulous, but it's deep but it has practical aspects, you know, so it's, it, it's, it, it's, and then that's why people have, you know, so much time after or around practice where you sit around and, and have talks like this mm-hmm. informal versions of this podcast, if you will. Well, this, this is meant to be designed to feel like those type of conversations because we aren't having them. We're not getting to go to the dojo. We can't go to seminars. So, right. Yeah. yeah I, I like absolutely. That. I like to try to keep this as informal as possible, even though we are publishing the thoughts. And because it's more of a conversation, you don't have to feel like, oh, I'm teaching someone. So someone has to listen to me and say, (laughs) take this. Absolutely. So I was just want to go back to you. You moved to Portland. You wanted to make sure you have uh, a kendo dojo that you can practice in. So you're just continuing this along with the rest of your, I guess, professional life. When did you start realizing that this was going to be uh, a longer term thing for you? Like, was it lifestyle decision? Yeah, like something yeah. that's be a legacy in some ways? Well, I, I've told this story a lot of times and I, I'm sure Iwakabe Sensei hates it, but it's, I love it because it, 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 it's somewhat true. And I, and, and I've embraced it. You know, when I went to Denver, I, I saw Kendo and, you know, I, the the school Rocky Mountain Budokan was very what people call traditional school and you know manners and procedures and things were important and and so you didn't just show up for kendo because you were there you so I had to go through a process of asking you know can I join the kendo group can I you know start kendo and I and I remember very well sitting down on a on a sofa uh somewhere I can't remember if it was the dojo or someone's apartment and but we had this big discussion and and Iwakabe sensei said you know you can start kendo but if you start you can't stop and so I agreed without thinking I said yeah and so in some ways you know I I embraced that and and you know I got to the point where I just you know it's what you do I don't even think about should I quit or should I do something else I mean it's just part of of functioning right and 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 the, the part I find that, that tickles me, maybe not Iwakabe Sensei, is that, you know, I stopped karate after 10 some years and, and continued on Kendo and I always say he never made me give that promise for karate. <laughs> so that was the loophole that got me out of all that practice. <laughs> and it's, you know, the, the joking aside, the, the, the reality is you, you can't do too many things. You know, doing Kendo and Iaido is really hard. I mean, that's why you see people that do just one and, and not both. Um, it takes a lot of time away from your family. Um, I, I have a job where, you know, at certain points in my career, I've traveled all over the world and it takes you away from your family. So to, to you know, then have the situation where you got to spend hours at the dojo, it's hard, you know. So it's, you know, I think you're, you're getting at the point, unless it's just part of your nature where you enjoy this and you want to use it as a way of developing and pursue it and you're trying to solve the 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 riddle you know you find that interesting and just embrace it i think it gets really hard what was i think my first karate teacher carl walker said once and i don't know where he got the quote from but it was uh, without the spirit of repetition practice becomes very hard <laughs> oh yeah so like that that's interesting like I'm sure a lot of people are, will face this eventually too when we get back to traveling. But if you're doing work, you have that you have to focus on that takes you away from your family. Um, if, oh, yeah. if you don't have, if your family's not involved with the, the martial arts, then that also is something that you're away. So how have you, how's that balance been over the course of the years? Like I know some people will have on and off days, like when a child is born they might take extra time or when when their spouse has a vacation then they'll take a break and do a sabbatical or something how have you managed the martial arts over like a long period right, of right. balance that with your family well you know one thing i'm sure everyone will say that practices is you know if you practice you just feel better so you know fundamentally if you stop missing 
start missing practices because you don't have time. You notice it. You don't sleep as good. You, you know, you're, you're so-called not in shape and all those things happen. So you just feel better if you make an effort. I think that um, when you're young, you know, like I, I had opportunities to practice every day. You know, I just, you know, the, and I think that's important when you're at that point where you're, you're, you're youthful enough that your body's strong enough to do it and your family work commitments aren't so much, you know, that you can pull it off. And then later in life, you know, I, you know, it's like the way I approach older people training in kendo and things. It's just, you, you need to know how much you can push yourself. You know, it's not the, it's not the sensei's job or it's not the, the class's job, the, 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 whatever your act, drills you're doing to push you. So you learned how far you can be pushed. That's a, that's what the young people need. That's, um, you know, we can talk about this, this concept of forging versus polishing that I'm kind of thinking about lately, maybe in, in a bit, but the, you know, when you're young and forging, you, you need to go and, and, and push past that point where you, you think you're in a problem, but when you're older, you're an adult, you're mature, you know how your body works, you know what's going to hurt if you so you have to be able to participate in that way. And so that's one of the things that I try to work on and help people f- understand is that you don't have to feel that peer pressure to come every time if you're, you know, if you're, you've got things at work, you have family events, but as long as you're continuing to push down the, the road, it, it's not so important that it's every day. So I think, you know, you do that when you're young, but then when you're older, you have to manage without just, it's not a, you know, it's not an on off switch. You've got to kind of vary that. And, and, you know, for me, I was fortunate. My, my wife was very understanding and she's, you know, very confident and and doesn't like freak out if I leave. Um, You know, I've had the fortune of uh, working for different companies that have taken me all over the world. and, And, you know, I think I've been to Japan something like 80 times and, um, when I was working in Japan at the peak, I was going something like seven, eight times a year for two, three weeks each. And I, you know, I reckon when I was a member at Noma Dojo, I probably trained 500 or more 600 times there. And that was every day, you know, but I could do it in, in morning practice before work started, you know, so you, 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 you kind of have to figure out what's the volume your body can do, your life can tolerate. And then you get outside of Japan, you get outside of big cities, you've got the problem now. I know you talked to Ando Sensei recently up in Alaska. He's got the same problem I do. We're in the middle of nowhere, Kindle wise. So even if I was, you know, win the lottery and I can practice every day and my knees are suddenly healed and, and, and I'm strong again and uh, you, you can't because there's only, you know, a handful of people in the middle of nowhere and there's only so much you can do. So I think, you know, that all that just kind of comes back to, you need to, uh, you know, just, just embrace what you have and put your heart into it, you know, have a good, have, have a valuable practice come back out of that. Mm -hmm. Like this zoom phenomenon. I, I've been training a lot in EIDL lately. Um, I've been, I actually upped the level of the number of Yaido classes in my Zoom schedule that I teach and decreased Kendo because I, I feel like it just suits itself more to EI. And, and also people can can get things that that they haven't been able to get other ways. You know, it gets it gets harder when you don't have a sensei or you're more remote. Mm-hmm. So um yeah. So before we, before Zoom came along, like no one, if you did live in a remote area, you didn't have access to higher level senses, but even then, like you, you can't supplement in-person training to, with right. something remote like this. Oh, absolutely. But luckily, like for people in Boise, at least they have someone like you who has had that foundation piece. So maybe you could talk a bit about that the early days, like you, you, you had that foundational practice and then the Japan days where you really like forged into something that bringing it to Boise is an experience that even some big cities wouldn't have that kind of. Yeah. No, to be clear though, there's, I mean, there was a, a kendo club in Boise before I got here and they, they have, you know, a good group of, of black belts. And, you know, at the peak, I think we had something like 30 people here in Boise. And, uh, um, you know, right now there's, a, there's a handful, uh, people, you know, move and, 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 uh, family things happen and injuries, but you know, it's, um, 
you know, it's still, you've, you've got to travel to wherever the, the center for, for seminars and things. It's, you know, like, so what I did when I was young, you know, and I, and I wasn't in Denver in the summers doing kendo and Iaido is I would go to Seattle, which is, I don't know, what is it? Five, six hours drive from, um, from Moscow Pullman over to Seattle and, and you have to do that for the weekend. And then when I lived in Portland, it was a single club and, you know, we were kind of a bunch of need ons running stuff back in the day and we'd go up to Seattle. And I think when I was in my twenties, we'd go up to Seattle almost every weekend to do kendo, you know, that's the kind of, which is like at that time could be a, just over a two hour drive because traffic wasn't too bad if you pushed it. Um, so, you know, you got to make, effort. I think that, you know, what, what does that mean these days is, you know, you, you go to, you go attend seminars and you, you, you seek out training and advice and, 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 you know, you get that camaraderie and friendship, right. The people that, that you're, you don't see except for those events, you know, and now we're, we're starting to go, Oh gosh, once the COVID's gone, we need to uh, figure out how to keep, you know, zoom training in the curriculum. So, you know, I can have people that, that you don't ever see in your normal practice part of your weekly training. Um, you know, here in Boise, we've, you know, as I've, you know, I, I settled back here after living a long time in Portland and I had been to Japan so many times and, you know, through, through all the various contacts in, you know, from senseis coming from Fukuoka and Sapporo and the connections in Noma and other places. And, and now with the Nito group, I mean, there's, there's a huge network I can tap into. And so I've been bringing people here. I mean, we've had world-class events in Boise. And, and so it's, it's been fun because I've kind of came at it the other way. I finally had the ability to host these types of events and then I could do them here and then have everyone else come here instead of having to always be traveling and going off and, and seeking, seeking the right kinds of training. So that kind of, that kind of thing happens over a long period of time. You have to first develop the relationships, then you have to create a, a base in, in the city so then you can invite people and then also have time to do that. Can you talk about like, what did you have to go through to, to build up these relationships so that they can, they are willing to come out here and then create enough people in the group, at least to, to organize something like this in a small town? Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I never had that as my goal, right? You know, I never said one day we'll be able to have it here. So keep training. No, it was, I I think it's more of a, you know, you just sit around and, oh, I know these people and why don't I ask them if they'll come, you know, and that's, that's what happened. I mean, with like, uh, for example, with Kaneda Sensei coming and, you know, he's, um, you know, fairly well known outside of Japan as a very young and um, interesting, uh, very uh, helpful teaching type of Iaido sensei. You know, he's, uh, he's three months younger than me. He's Hachidan. He's won the all Japan championship eight times. I mean, I didn't know him, but all of the, the people that went to IBU in Katsura, they knew him. And, and then, I had a network connection through, I've been to Kitamoto, the leadership camp three times. And I knew people in Latin America that invited me there for events that led to me meeting other people from other countries that they just knew Kanedis and say, and then one day they said, Hey, you know, we're talking and said, would he be interested in coming to the U S and so they asked him, you know, so it's, it's more, it's kind of like a Kendo thing. Like when do you hit? Well, if you're, if you're young, you're trying to hit like Kagari Geiko all the time, right? But you get more skill, that's disastrous because the timing doesn't make sense. So you got to, and if you wait, that doesn't work. You're, you're just finding that moment, you know, and that in some ways there's an analogy, you know, training's full of all these analogies that we can find, but it's, you know, how to have these kind of events was just, oh gosh, I could do that now, right? And I can ask this person. I mean, the Nito camp is another example. It I think what this year would have been the 13th year and, and it, it went from an event in Salt Lake that I had nothing to do with. And I drove over kind of on a lark and I said, I don't know who these people are. It could be, could be great. It could be just hilarious or crazy. And it, it turned out they're some of the nicest, most technically skilled people I'd ever met. And, and it just was like, well, let's do this again. And then little by little, 
you know, it kind of got into an annual event that I got involved in as, as the organizer and then kind of changed the venue and expanded. And then it, and it, you know, and then at some point Toda Sensei started coming, you know, and that's amazing. I mean, he's, he's one of those people like, wow. I mean, who would have thought Toda Sensei would come to Boise, Idaho to teach Kendo. Right. And, but that's, you know, it's, it's I think it's the byproduct of, of our training. I mean, you, um, I think you know Hatakanaka Sensei really well. I mean, there's there's a long list that it's just it happens. You meet these big names in our world, and then somehow you get these connections, and it, it just kind of grows. It's very organic. Um, I'm not smart enough to plot it all out. I don't know how you would do that. <laughs> I just think you just look around and see who who's uh, enthusiastic, and see see if you can get everybody work on something together. So you got connected to Canada Sensei because of this um, prior connection to Latin America. Can you talk about your involvement with CLAC and? Yeah, sure. I mean, that was, you know, I went to Kitamoto um, back in, what was it, 85, 86, and I think 92. I keep forgetting if it was 92 or 93, but I, I went to Kitamoto when it was, you know, the first was uh, two full weeks of some of the hardest training I ever did. You know, it was six, seven hours a day. And uh, I mean, it was, it was what you would, it's what you'd pay your money for if you wanted a real experience. Right. But I met, you know, all kinds of Hachidans. I met people from around the world. Um, you know, I, uh, well, the, <laughs> in fact, the job I have right now is you asked about clack, but the job I have right now is because I went to Kitamoto back in the eighties. So I, I was quite good friends with uh, Jesus Maya sensei from Mexico because he was at those camps in the eighties. We were both er early mid twenties and it's about same rank. And I speak reasonable Spanish and, and he speaks much better English. And, and, you know, we had a lot of fun and, and somehow over the years we kept in reasonable touch and he was the one who invited me to clack. And so, you know, and, and, and mentioning like this Belgian connection. So Serge Hendricks and Serge Bolfa, some of these guys that are senior in the Belgium Kendo Federation, the European Kendo Federation, I, um, you know, I met them and hung out with them as young Kendo player in, in Kitamoto. But then I was between jobs in 2009 and I had a ticket to go to Europe. And I just on a lark went to a Belgium um, a kendo camp, the Nakakura event that, that, that Serge holds every year. And, you know, it's, it's an amazing event. It's week long. People come from all over Europe. There's, there's Hachidan, Nanadan training for kendo, for EI, for Jodo. There's a tournament, there's a restaurant bar in the, in the gym, there's a dorm. I mean, it's, it's great. So I just went because I had, I had a ticket and I hadn't seen him in years. And, and while I was there, I looked up somebody I'd worked with years ago who lived in Belgium. And he said, hey, you know, I got this project and we're starting this thing. And would you be interested? And within two months from that, I had a job and I've been doing it for 11 years now in electron microscopy. And it was all, you could work it out. It's all because I went to Kitamoto back in 85 and spoke Spanish, right? So, um, it's certainly one of the things I've told people and I tell young people too, if, if you can, you know, embrace something like this and you want to go travel, you can meet a lot of interesting connections. Um, you know, I've, uh, the, the sister city of Portland, Oregon is Sapporo. Um, one of the groups that we, you know, I haven't been as close to in quite a while, but at, at one time in the nineties, the Sapporo city hall kendo club, was, um, you know, very close with Obukon Kendo Club, which I ran for many years. And, you know, so I've been to Sapporo. I had a limousine take me around to the ski jump area. And, you know, I practiced the, the mayor was a kendo man. It's, you know, it's these, these interesting connections you would never imagine. So with, with Maya Sensei, he, he just asked me to come down and help uh, the Mexican team and help the event was the clack the first time I went. I can't remember if it was the second or third CLAC event. So CLAC is Confederacion, the Confederation of Latin American Kendo. Um, and I and I went down and helped Shimpon and participate and Keiko and everything. So I did that for quite a while. And I met a lot of the people in the other countries too. And, you know, Chile and Argentina and 
I mean, just I've been to Columbia a couple times that weren't CLAC events because they asked me back. I've had invitations to other countries that COVID has kind of slowed down and stopped me from seeing. So I've never done kendo in Brazil. I've always wanted to. I've been to Brazil for work, but I've yet I've yet to do kendo in Brazil. So yeah, it's you know it doesn't kendo's not usually thought of as a as a, a way of and and when I say kendo I mean iaido to me it's the same thing but it's 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 not thought of as a way to go visit the world or make friends but it really is I mean I like when I moved to Portland I I called up the kendo club and talked to somebody and it was like sure yeah and we practice on this night and if you need a place to stay you know it's that kind of stuff we don't even know each other it just it it's it does some cool things on the on the personal side yeah, it's already. I'm already getting a picture of how, if someone were to look from the outside and were to Google your name, there'd be, oh, he's involved in U.S., involved in uh, Latin America. He's been to Japan so many times. They would imagine that someone that just says, oh, I'm so into kendo. I'm gonna, I'm gonna plan to do this. I'm gonna be involved in this. Blah blah. blah. <laughs> but more likely, it's just you're, you're just a person that, in some ways, goes with the flow. If someone wants you to ask you for something, you're just like. Sure, let's try it out. Try out a new experience. Get to know some new people. It's, it's just more of a organic thing for you, and it just. These, I, I, yeah, I think good. that's yeah. that's certainly true. I and, and you know I'm, I'm 61, so I I find you know you just you tend to think about those things too now a lot more. I mean, like, oh yeah, so we've done this for all these years and. Well, let's let's have some fun too, right? I mean, it's when you're young, you can you can spend time thinking we train we train hard, right? And that's cool. But you know, it's it's family, job, then kendo, and, and if you can find a way to kind of blend some things together um, and, and have some enjoyment and fun out of it, I think it, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So speaking of that. In recent years, what would you say are memorable, positive, fun, or engaging events you've had, you've been to, or experiences you've had? Wow. I mean, it's, you know, you, it doesn't matter. Even if you're not very clever, 40 years, you'll have something happen, right? So, I mean, I, um, I, I've had a lot. I mean, one of the, you know, if I talk kind of selfishly, maybe first, one of the big highlights was... Uh, uh, my wife went with me to Japan in 2018. I took the Hachidan test for Kendo. Um, I really enjoyed that. I, I, as near as I know, I'm the only uh, what natural citizen, if you will, someone who didn't become a citizen of U.S. Uh, later but was born here that's taken that test. There's been others since me, but I think I was the first uh, U.S. citizen, natural U.S. citizen, to take that test. And it was, I had a lot of fun. I um, I mean, I can talk for a long time about what that test is about and what you have to do and the realities of, of non-Japanese people passing it. It's, um, so I enjoyed that even though I didn't pass. I, you know, I, I kind of lumped that in with recent activity or I've started participating in the Kyoto Imbu Taikai. That's quite an experience. Um, you know, the, the Nito camps have been highlights just because of they're so fun. I mean, it's, it's the, it's unlike a national event or an international event where it's very scripted and all the teachers kind of have to follow certain uh, formats that with the Nito camp, it's, it's more like a local event, but then it's international because of who comes. And so you get, you get a lot more personal interaction with people. You, you, you get to have a lot of fun and yet you, you learn things that you might not across at a, you know, a more traditional national level event. Um, you know, the, um, I've been having a lot of fun here locally, just not focusing on all that stuff on other countries and national, and just trying to focus on the local activity. We, we went through a period here in Idaho where we lost our, um, practice location at a YMCA and we're slowly starting to, uh, have practice at a, at a, a parks and rec facility and they were they were wonderful and we were just starting to kind of get that to go when this COVID happened and so it was you know I, I'm looking forward to when we can can restart that because I think there's a lot of fun and enjoyment to, to working with a local group and you know kind of showing showing people okay here's here's how to practice here's what we do and then also you know helping them have new friendships and, and, and fun along the way. I, you know, my, I, 
for a lot of years, I used to sign my emails to my students, uh, train hard, have fun. And that's still, you know, that's still, I believe absolutely you have to train hard, but I also think it has to be fun. And so for me, trying to find that locally is, you know, that's a, that's a highlight. It's not, you know, something that's happened, but it's something I'm working on and trying to get to. Mm -hmm. So we got the fun part and then the, the actual training hard part. So that can also be broken down into a few things. One of them is just rep repetition. Um, one of it is like just feeling the burn. Like if you're building muscle or building conditioning, it's hard on the body. But another thing is challenges that hit you in your ego in some ways, like things that make you feel uh, like less confident, whether it's like a failure in a grading or it's a, um, loss in a tournament or it's just not meeting certain expectations. But those also give us a lot of learning and allow us to grow in certain ways. Do you have instances that you could share of that where challenges have later become when you look back as some of the biggest growth opportunities for you? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I love that. Um, you know, my, I, you know, knee surgery, I, I never, I did Iido for, I think, 36 years without knee pads. And I used to do, um, I used to do um, uh, Nukiuchi Bato, where you, you know, the version where you jump up in the air and land on your knees. Oh, yeah. I used to do that on hardwood and just smile at people because it would just make them cringe, right? And I never had knee problems. But then um, in 2015, my knees went out and I have had knee surgeries and I'm, I can do things, but I'm, I'm, you know, like I'll tell my students, if I don't do knee exercises and stretches and strengthening, I can't do EI properly these days. So that, that's been hard, you know, and I know everybody has certain physical problems and things, but, you know, and I've had shoulder surgery and wrist surgery and different, I blew out my Achilles or my, my Achilles, my um, plantar fascia when I was younger. And, you know, those are just manageable, but the knees were hard because it changed a lot of how I had to do if I wanted to keep doing this I had to you know as you said it's a, it was a real challenge um you know another one I like I make fun of myself because I want I want to keep it in my mind I, I've taken the sandan or the <laughs> sandan the the nanadan test for EI three times in Japan and I haven't made it I I thought the last time I was pretty close but I screwed up in such a way that I, I can tell you you never want to have the panel of six Hachidon, three of them all of a sudden snapped their heads at your direction. So what I did was I had gone and, and had been working on changing the way I was uh, uh, um, finishing um, kata. And in, in, in Sampogiri, instead of, instead of coming back into Jodan, because I was trying to change the way I was doing it, I knew something was different. And instead of doing the right thing, I did Yoko Chiburi. Because it was, it was, I wasn't thinking, but I was trying not to do my normal and it just came out wrong. And I saw these three Hachidan heads just bop, right? And so what do you do? You just finish, you know, you failed. And then, you know, but I've, I've looked at that and, and, and I've, at some point when I got over the, 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 the frustration, you know, I didn't dwell on it too long. I did double down and start training more and, and I'm not in a rush to pass seven on, but now I've got a more, uh, it's helped me build a better strategy of how I'm training and what I'm doing to prepare. So, um, yeah, I mean, those are, there's a couple examples of, of, of things. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's more. We all, as you said, we all have ups and downs, you know, and sometimes it's just the, the, the mental attitude, right. Of, you know, how many of us hate going to practice, but I think, all those people that have hated going at some point, you never leave regretting it, right? Mm -hmm. So you can find those mini challenges too in there. Okay. Uh, so at this point, I, I have some like, what I co call rapid fire questions as in they're okay. short questions, but yeah, yeah. You, can, you can take as much time to answer. You can do short answers or long answers. Um, so one question is, do you have a quote or a proverb or a motto that you like that, uh, you live by or practice by informs things you do? You know, I have a, I actually have a document that I, I, I maintain in words called Kotowaza. 
and I, it's an ongoing log where when I hear interesting, so koto wazas are phrases or expressions, you know, um, and, 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 you know, like, uh, um, the, the one I've, I've come across recently is daikyo sokuke, right? So, um, that's talking about, uh, uh, big and strong. And then, um, um, oh, I forgot what's sokuke. I always forget going uh, back quick. and forth. It's quick. quick or faster. Yeah. Fast, fast, right. Fast and, uh, um, K light. Light, light. So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, that one is a, I, I mentioned earlier about the, the forging versus polishing. So I kind of stumbled into that. I, I do a talk now on the metallurgy of swords and how it applies to, to training, which is kind of a trying to bring my ho my hobby, which is practice, right, with my life, with my work, which is electron microscopy. And so anyway, I have this thing. And so that one isn't something I live my life by or have, you know, up or I've thought about getting a tattoo, none of that, right? But it's I came across it and I find it interesting. And so what I'm what I'm, you know, because I was thinking, what what is my slogan? I don't really have one, but I I tend to find things and then try and use them and keep them in my head. You know, one that's important to me is make yo shi sui, you know, looking into the clear mirror, still water. This was something that my uh, teacher at Noma Dojo, uh, Umemura Toshihiko Sensei, was or was sharing with me at great length before he passed away, and and so it it it. I found it to be quite important at high level training and, uh, um, and it's one of those, it's hard to explain, but it's got so much going on in there, you know? And so I like that. Um, but yeah. And, you know, I've, I, I, I tend to try and find ones and then a lot of times, um, incorporate them into different training I'm doing with the uh, zoom and, and, and so forth. I mean, if you, you were in zoom right now, you can see behind me is Mushin and, Jiri Ichi, those are, those are kind of important. <laughs> so. Cool. Um, what have you changed your mind on recently? Something that used to be believed strongly on that you now have a different perspective or something you didn't think was important that now you feel like, okay, at this stage in my either career or life, it's uh, more important? Yeah, I, that's a that's a hard one to come up with a quick answer for, right? So what have I changed? I mean, you know, I could you can sit down and make a huge list, right, of of little details and how I'm using my foot and what I'm doing with my hips and and you know what why why do what's my motivation for training? I mean, all those things. I'm you're always tweaking them, right? I mean, you you you're not the same person you were a year ago or five years or ten years ago. Um, I don't know. I think, I don't know that it's a change, but maybe a refinement is just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing down this path that for me, what is making training just a normal part of life and a healthy part of life? And, 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 and not just from a philosophical point of view, but from a, you know, approach to training, you know, so not, not just doing it, but also, how I'm doing it and the quality of what I'm doing and just kind of trying to fully be there. Um, you know, so it's not really a big change. It's something I've tried over the years. And I think at some point when you're training a long time, you kind of get to this place where, Oh, little small light bulbs start to go off. Like, Oh, now I can do that. Or, Oh, that's starting to make more sense. And, and, and so I think that's the enjoyment of, knowing you'll never make it, but start to say, well, I'm, I can kind of see it from here. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it sounds like it's, it's just like, there are things that in your early days, it was just one straight path. And now you see that there's signposts or there's forks in the road, but Hey, there's more options that I can take. And now sure. you can just play around with like, oh, yeah. try one. Yeah. This. And that's what you'd hope. Right. I mean, if you did, if you did the same thing week in, week out, at, you know, with for 40, 50 years, it'd be pretty boring. But, you know, if you, and that was this, this concept about forging and polishing, you know, if you, if this, uh, the Dai Kyo Soku K, if you, if you think about in the beginning, it's, it's very strict, it's big, it's powerful. You got to drive, don't, you know, shut up, don't ask questions, do it, do it again, you know, suck it up. 
all of that foundational stuff is like analogous to, you know, processing the metal for the sword, folding it, getting the carbon content, quenching it, shaping it, all that. And then the hard part is arguably the most boring, which is the polishing, you know, and then, but you can't polish unless you built it right. So, you know, you, you, and, and I think, you know, one of the things that, that I wish I could do a better job of or have a better opportunity of is helping people that are really serious about training make that leap because by definition outside of Japan you don't have the depth of 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 senior students so it it's a lot easier to just kind of transition into higher level stuff it's more natural where outside you tend to still be doing things the way you did it in your 20s because you never had a teacher tell you there's this other way or show you a different way and um you know, I, I, I'm trying my best to help older people or people that are more long-term practice to see, you know, how to maybe tweak things a little bit. So it's not that forging process and then have that positive spirit of polishing, you know, which is arguably very boring, but that's where all the really cool stuff comes out. <laughs> yeah. I can already get small glimpse of, of where you're going with this analogy. So I can't wait for you to hear more as you have it more developed. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, I, I, I'm always seeking these analogies, right? And I just, I've been really tickled to stumble into this, you know, I was preparing a talk on the sword metallurgy, and I just kind of came into this thing and then started poking at it. And gosh, you know, this is really important, you know, of how yeah, you view you this. Yeah. Um, the next question would be, uh, how do you, you, men you mentioned you had that uh, Kotowaza document. Uh, uh, is there other ways that you record what you've learned or things that you're thinking about or um, what is your preferred note-taking methodology? Well, when I was young, I, I took notes every class, certainly, you know, and so, you know, what's, what's the Stroud method? It's, it's when you're a beginner, you, you write down everything, um, you know, and I, I'm not a fan of note-taking during seminars, although I know sometimes it's important because you can't, you get such a short window to get it. You want to record it so you don't lose it. I understand that, but I'm, I'm more a, like a fan of uh, not recording demonstrations and spending all your time looking at the camera or not writing, but just be there and experience it. But after class writing everything down. So I did that, you know, I have logs somewhere in this house of all my practices. And I know there's people in Japan that, record each keiko they have you know who they fought couple comments about it and and things like that um i when i started teaching i was a very inexperienced very young and and i i did a lesson plan of very because i went through a another benefit of going through iwakabe sensei's program is he had a instructor's class that ran that was part of that four or five hours every saturday and and so i had a very strong um process for creating a lesson plan but then you know i haven't done like in my actual class I, I i will when it's needed but i rarely will do a lesson plan even for seminars i'll just have a kind of a rough outline i just done it long enough i can i like um, adjusting it for the audience and so you get very refined um Nowadays, I just, I tend to take notes more because of Zoom and, and little things will pop up that are interesting and I'll scribble them down in a notebook. Um, it, it's, you know, I think the next step which needs to happen is to maybe sit down and try and take all this random stuff and put it into some form that kind of has a story to tell and is interesting. Um, but um uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a big fan about trying to internalize all this stuff and not getting hung up on remembering every single detail. Because if you have if you have a good operating mode, you know, like I'm big on trying to find theory that ties EI to kendo or that motion to this motion, and then if you just use the theory, things tend to come out right. And mm -hmm. so I think that's partially why I'm not a slave to note taking these days, but I do when I find things that are useful and stuff, I, I like to document them and try and, you know, make them part of the story. 
Well, it gets back to the almost the very first thing we were talking about was it's so hard to articulate some concepts or to just use oh, language yes. to explain something. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. And then, you know, it's, and it, and it changes too, like what you think it is. And, and it's, I mean, it's, it's a mental construct, right? All this stuff. And, um, you know, even the, um, the, the motion we do like in EI, it's a, it's a construct. And you're just, you're following that construct to get something to happen or to realize some, some result and, and, or experience something. And so it's in some ways very artificial, but then in other ways, there's aspects that are really, you know, they're milestones. They're, they don't move. They're there. They're, they're constant throughout. So, yeah, I think, you know, the people that can, you know, articulate stuff, uh, related to martial arts training in depth are really valuable. And, and it's, it's quite, quite a joy when you have friends that are like that and people that can talk about it because it, you know, it gets you excited. It's, 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 it's the other side of all this physical effort. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're finding something that's very uh, cerebral and intriguing. Well, that's why I like doing these interviews too, because it's not necessarily asking for a specific answer, but to hear so how someone talks out loud and thinks mm. while speaking. So I don't, I don't want something that's super polished. Oh, I've thought this and blah blah, just this. But the way that the, the way that your mind works as you're talking out a an idea, it yeah, it's yeah. interesting, and it also different parts resonate with a person differently. Yeah, and you know, I. I I'm, I'm always happy when I kind of have find a theme to follow. Like I've been spending a lot of time this zoom training this year about how to move your hips and how to, how to get from here to there by doing, but, it, and, and coming at it from a different way. And so that's like one of those things about zoom is it's, it's allowed me maybe to think of different ways of moving and different ways of communicating that if, you know, if we were in a dojo and, you just would demonstrate and they'd follow and you'd make minor corrections and things. So, yeah. 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 Okay. So but, that's it for the deep questions. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know if I had any deep one. answers, but I definitely had deep questions. Uh, so nowadays, or even before, when you travel for Yaido or Kendo, besides your actual equipment, is there something that you like that you always need to take with you? Something that's important in terms of traveling, a small item like a water bottle or a flashlight. Huh. Huh. Yeah, you know, I've I've been fortunate in what I do that I, you know, I for work I've been able to go a lot of places. And then like what I what I've tried to do is when when the work week is done is schedule time that allows me to to spend like a weekend at a seminar or something. So you know, it's it's more practical based. It's just figuring out you know what's the the basic travel setup. You know, and I'm always, even when I don't travel with equipment, I, you know, I have kind of a, I just have figured out I need this suitcase for me and I need that for the, for the whatever, if I'm doing kendo or yai or both and kind of sorting that out. And that's, you know, that's, I think using, you know, golf bags and things have made it a lot easier, but that's always been a hard thing. Um, you know, I just, you just need a uniform. I mean, I don't, I don't, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I have one Eido belt I really like. So maybe that's the, that's the thing you're looking for. I've had it since 86 an OB that I, no, I, it's, it's more about uh, just having the right things. I, you know, I'm my laptop because it's work, right? I mean, that's probably the thing I panic that and a passport. <laughs> so it's not, there's really not a martial arts uh, item, you know, and, and maybe, maybe what I'll do is I'll pack certain tenaguis for a trip. You know, because some, you know, I have something like 300 tenaguis somewhere in a box. And, you know, so somehow I'll find a certain one and, and use that for some reason. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what would you consider your comfort food? Well, I mean, I like cooking a lot. Um, you know, so gosh, comfort food. There's so many is the problem when you like cooking and eating, right? So, um, well, like tonight, we're, I'm going to make uh, okonomiyaki for my wife because it's her birthday. And that's a pretty good comfort food. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. I like ramen. Maybe ramen's a pretty good go-to. Is um, there a specific type? What type of soup base? Yeah, um, probably miso ramen or 
a Sapporo rum. I don't know. It's you see, you're you're asking me these questions, and 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 I agree there should be one, right? But they're all good. So how do you pick the one? Yeah, it's uh, you know, I think good, rich, well-made food from uh, natural ingredients is quite wonderful. You know, so it's it's you know, you can find many different kinds of comfort food. Um, you know, some of the Japanese things I cook are are basically comfort food, Japanese comfort food, like like nikujaga is. I love making nikujaga. You know, and it's just beef stew, but it's it's nice and delicious. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's the answer. Maybe I'll go with nikujaga for this podcast. <laughs> nice. Uh, okay, and last question before we close off: um, If someone were to log into your YouTube account. YouTube recommends videos based on what you've watched in the past. What kind of videos will we see YouTube recommending to you? No, oh, it's a mix of crazy and the hardcore uh, Kendo Iaido. So what would, yeah, I, you know, I, one of the things I did that I'm quite proud of is uh, uh, I, I finally, after all these years of speaking horrible Japanese, I taught myself the 2000 Joyo Kanji this year. So I can finally read a little bit at some level and I can spend a lot more time on Japanese only websites. So you'll find quite, you'll find more content than you'd probably expect that's in Japanese, you know, cause I can search now for things that in YouTube that are, that are all, um, you know, kanji based, Japanese based, mm-hmm. but there's a fair amount of silliness. So <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> I don't know if I want people to see what all I looked at. <laughs> okay. Well, this has been a very interesting, fascinating conversation. I'm glad we were able to cover topics that weren't in other interviews um, that we saw about stuff. So um, is there any closing message that you want to say to the audience, something that you've been thinking about that you'd like to share to a wider base? Well, I, you know, I, I really appreciate this chance. Um, you know, as I, as I told you early on, it's like you and I, we've known each other for a long time. But we really never had a chance to talk. So this is kind of fun. This was like, for me, even if there wasn't a podcast, I got to chat with you a little bit and uh, I find that to be fantastic. I really, you know, anybody that's, that's listening in and, you know, you're, you're training or not training, you know, just, you know, the only real message I have is, is, you know, stay positive and, you know, look for, look for good things to focus on and really embrace, you know, live, live to your fullest, I guess is the way you'd want to say that. So enjoy you know if you're if you're thinking about training or if you're training you know just you know fully commit and enjoy it you know make it make it so it's a fun thing and and um i think you know sharing with other people is important so you know my hat's off to you for doing this mm-hmm. and you know i just um i'm looking forward to seeing what happens after covid lightens up and we can start having this new mix of real training and virtual training and i think it's going to be really exciting and expand what we're all doing yeah it's going to be super interesting well thanks again appreciate the opportunity i'll see you again soon sometime all right take care bye